All right, welcome everyone who is attending virtually. Uh, I'm here representing a, a large team. Uh, this has really been a labor of love over the last 10 years. Um, and uh, one thing I want to start with announcing uh, that UW-Madison is actually going to be expanding its team. I just got the green light to advertise they're going to be hiring a new tenure track uh, faculty member in cartography. So if you're ABD uh, or a postdoc uh, or recently started a job, uh, please talk to me. Or if you're uh, virtual, talk to Tanya uh, Buckingham Anderson uh, through Slack. We'd be happy to field questions. Job should post in November. Okay, so during uh, the pandemic, uh, I know m many of our research uh, projects have been impacted in substantial ways. And in the CART lab, we downshifted some of our basic research and instead focused on um, uh, polishing a lot of our educational materials uh, for presentation as open uh, educational resources. And so just a few highlights. Uh, first, the CART lab uh, produced a, a free and open textbook. There's a free cartography textbook out there uh, that was co-published by the International Cartographic Association and United Nations. Uh, many of our students uh, 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 produce maps. There's some like almost 250 original figures. Um, we also have a technical supplement in QGIS on how to make some of those maps. A uh, shout out to Lily Hauptman who uh, was here. And uh, there's a, a student poster in the gallery uh, that, that shows, uh, that discusses uh, uh, much of that project. We're also wrapping up the JS and T body of knowledge. I've been the section editor for CART uh, Viz for the last five years. Um, we have 34 open access chapters available now. Uh, many of the authors are from the NASIS community, and so thanks again uh, to those who have contributed. Finally, what we're going to talk about today is an open uh, at, uh, workbook for learning uh, how to code uh, interactive and web maps. So not to further bury the lead, I want to just quickly give you a visual preview. Uh, the web mapping workbook uh, broadly introduces JavaScript for web mapping, but really introduces the variety of competencies required uh, to develop and deploy interactive maps on the web. Uh, our audience is cartographers who maybe weren't uh, trained in any programming, so we're really trying to teach coding to designers, um, but particularly instructors who re recognize that technology changes at a breakneck pace. Um, and, of course, students. We use this in uh, one of my classes. Uh, there's currently 11 chapters and 34 individual lessons. I tried to count last night the word count. I got up to like 80,000. So it's a sprawling, large resource, and one that's been funded by the National Science Foundation uh, and open for reuse, uh, revision, extension, uh, using a CCBY license. The workbook itself grew out of my advanced Geography 575 class. Um, this is a course that I was explicitly hired to uh, design uh, a decade ago. The lecture concepts introduce UX design, uh, and particularly interactive and mobile mapping. And then we put those principles into practice uh, on the open web. And so here's just a few recent examples from the class, uh, some of which have, have won awards uh, from, from the NASA's dynamic mapping competition. So as the story goes, uh, I was a developer at Penn State working for Alan McEachern, uh, working with Anthony Robinson uh, for a number of years. Um, and when I went to interview, uh, I had all of these awesome interactive maps to show and was you know, trying to show all these pretty things that I had developed. Um, there was a professor, Bill Cronin, in the back after my job talk who lifted this little kind of square thing and said, I can't access these maps. This, of course, was the first uh, iPad, first generation iPad. And of course, all of my experience uh, when I started day one was in uh, basically defunct uh, piece of software named Flash. Flash was great for us. When I asked my students, like, you know what Flash is? They say no today, which is amazing. Um, it was great for cartographers because we already knew Illustrator and Photoshop. And so kind of like the ecosystem of UX design just made sense uh, for, uh, for that transition. So I was tasked when I first started at UW, again, now a decade ago, we're gonna kind of tell the story of, of how this workbook came to be, with figuring out what's next, what should we teach? And it was really wide open at the time. I think it, it's daunting today to choose the right technology, but there were a lot of upstarts uh, at the time. And the first project we did in the CART lab was what's called a comparative analysis. This is a usability method where we took a variety of competing tools that had somewhat similar uh, uh, or at least advertise similar functionality, and then assess them based on our needs. And our needs, of course, were cartography. We were looking at different representation designs, base maps, thematic maps, uh, and for this particular course, this 575 course, thinking about different interactions, ways users can manipulate the display. 
what, which of these tools uh, we're supporting. And even early on, we were seeing some broad patterns of kind of the slippy map uh, dominance of panning, zooming, retrieve. But doing this uh, 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 project also showed us some early outliers. There was this thing that maybe you've heard of D3 that had just launched that had kind of a unique, interesting signature that was different from the signatures of a lot of other tools uh, at the time. Uh, so then we uh, spent a summer, we, had, we hired four uh, uh, student cartographers in the cart lab to go through a hypothetical lab exercise and maintain a diary. Uh, I gave them egg timers and every hour they had to write down their emotions, uh, how they were feeling. Lots of frustration early on. Um, but we had chosen four candidate tools at the time, D3, this other upstart uh, leaflet, the Google Maps API, which was kind of the dominant replacement of Flash, and open layers. And what we found was that students were able to develop about as much with tools like Leaflet uh, as Google Maps, but they had a much better time doing so. And so this bottom is showing the, the positive versus negative valence. Using Leaflet was a more positive experience than others. And I really believe that uh, I, I, we teach proprietary and open source tools. There's a real pedagogical advantage to teaching open source with coding because you can track it back to the, the raw source, right? You're not constrained by some sort of closed API. Happy to comment more on that. And so as a result of this, we published uh, two labs. We have a, a Leaflet lab and a, and a D3 lab that were the underpinning of my advanced course. Uh, I know that these were being used. These are published in, in cartographic perspectives. But we found a few years afterward that we were leaving too large of a, a group of the students behind in the class, that about 80% of the students were succeeding, but 20%, which is just too high for me, were, were still not grasping the concepts. And the reason being is that when you move from a development environment like Flash that's self-contained, that has uh, assets that you can develop within that system and then deploy as a single rich internet application, when you move to the open web, there's just a variety more of competency. Um, here is a graphic from our, uh, our recent textbook. It's almost like, uh, uh, you know, uh, ridiculous to try to make a graphic because the minute you do, it changes, right? Uh, here is a, 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 an overview of all the competencies now we have to teach. Um, things like HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, right? Uh, SVG specifications, JSON specification, um, the DOM, AJAX. And so there's just a broader variety of things that students need to know. And so you know, around 2015, Carl Sack turned me on to this constructivist model of pedagogy uh, called uh, spiral curriculum. And the idea is that students learn the most, and students, you, you might be a student as a cartographer wanting to learn how to code, learn the most when you're at the edge of anxiety, right? You don't want to be bored, but you don't want to feel so anxious that you feel like you're, you're, it's hopeless, right? I think we were maybe too far at the edge of anxiety. Early on, you need scaffolding, you need early wins, you need small, grokkable, bite-sized lessons, right? But then they build on one another in a spiral. We're always reviewing back, as well as projecting forecasting into the future. And so we try to design this curriculum as a spiral, so less, not too massive, big Roth labs, and instead, individual lessons. And then uh, through the NSF grant, we're able to tweak and tailor and say, okay, when, what lesson were we teaching too early? Which one too late? Um, this is uh, this box plot is showing a response to one of our uh, one of our uh, cycles, um, and so the circle is when we actually teach it in terms of the sequence. And then thing, some things were okay to teach a little bit later, where other things like uh, GitHub, a little spoiler for a second, um, but also like developer tools, we were teaching way too late uh, in that sequence. And so constantly tweaking over a three or four year span. So here as a preview, this is the current uh, status of uh, the workbook. And again, this is constantly under development. We re revise it every sort of January to March. Um, we've divided these lessons into three major units. The first unit is foundation. It's scaffolding. And we use geographic examples, but not necessarily cartographic examples. Um, here is just a, a little overview of how we've used Markdown, the GitHub language, uh, to stylize our web page. Um, and one of the important things is that all of the coding solutions are available from GitHub. And so you can watch the working code and also see how then we deconstruct it in the lab write-up. You have to go up here, it's linked from within it, but all the solutions, all, all of our code is readily available. Uh, our second unit then, we still use Leaflet. Leaflet has been really good to us. It's now the, the kind of the base of the Mapbox.js ecosystem. So it's a useful tool for then scaling up to the next level. Um, and we don't even start by coding. We start by using, by introducing documentation, examples, forums. So giving uh, the tools to learn how to learn, essentially, and to build confidence. 
We do ultimately move into some development. Uh, our first leaflet lab uh, teaches how to make uh, a, an animated and interactive proportional symbol map. So here you can see trying to link the visual. Flash was great because it was inherently visual, where developing on the open web is inherently non-visual. And so we're trying to always link the visual back um, through this. Our third lab then uh, introduces D3, uh, which is built on the SVG specification. Um, here you're seeing some of the code blocks. And so we take the overall solution and try to deconstruct it into bite-sized pieces. And of course, this always is accompanied with some uh, um, overview, often maybe some links uh, to, uh, to um, some external resources, uh, and as well often with a figure. And so here we're talking about um, some projections and path generators in D3. And by the end of this uh, sort of 11 or 12 week course, we get quite sophisticated. We're able to develop not just maps with D3, uh, but also uh, linked uh, graphics uh, and so on. So here's just a quick overview of building a choropleth map in D3. Okay, so uh, we did all this. I submitted a ni very nice annual report to my NSF grant officer uh, and happily went on sabbatical. I think the experience as an instructor trying to teach on the open web is basically every year you have to reassess, right? Um, I've been waiting two years to get this slide. This was on my door for a year. And so I've been waiting two years to get this slide into a presentation uh, at some point. That is me as a kid. I got back though and started to think, my sabbatical was in Europe and trying to see how we could expand the reach uh, of, of these materials. And so we've served the UW-Madison students very well. Uh, how can we think about serving an international community and particularly expanding out into the global south? And increasingly, it, GitHub seemed to be the right choice to serve as our learning platform. Uh, first, students will acquire and submit materials in a realistic medium. You uploading a zip of your like web map to, to Canvas is just a super unrealistic ask. You, you would never do that, right? And so instead, you commit your, and in the message say, here's my lab one, right? That's a realistic task that you're going to be able to take onto the job market. We also, as multiple instructors, our broad team of folks at, at, on the first slide can edit the workbook at the same time. Uh, and so this is definitely a team effort. I feel more like an editor than, than uh, uh, someone who's actually writing copy at this point. But we can all be working together because that's what GitHub is for. It's for collaborative coding, right? So it's collaborative uh, textbook writing in this case. We also get a revision history. So you can see what updates we've made. And then maybe if you need to make additional updates, again, we our cycle is pretty much every January to March when we teach the class. But in between, there's already been an update in D3 since the last time. So you can see what we've done and then what we haven't done through commit messages and pull requests. Uh, and because of that, instructors at other campuses can branch to meet your own needs. If you like this module but hate this one that we wrote it up, just mix and match, right? Um, and, and make this work for your own. It's, it's open source uh, as an NSF project. And finally, maybe collectively, all the folks in this virtual room can sort of be uh, taking a, a collective uh, task in maintaining our materials, right? And I would love to get feedback from folks uh, who look at the, at the workbook because we're always planning for the next revision cycle. It's highly dynamic. And so uh, I am no longer working in Word documents. We're trying to move into, into actually writing in, uh, in text editors as much as possible. Uh, and so here is uh, behind the scenes how we actually are drafting the textbook. Um, and so this is all GitHub Markdown. Uh, Markdown is a particular kind of text formatting uh, uh, specification. GitHub has its own uh, sort of quirks. Um, but behind the scenes, we're, we're editing um, primarily in, uh, in a text editor. Uh, Gareth Balrica uh, Franklin wrote this awesome conversion where you can take our GitHub Markdown and convert it to HTML to style with inline styles, so it's it's a single document um, HTML or vice versa. So if you have HTML, you can convert it back into GitHub Markdown. So here's what one of the conversions looks looks like. Uh, and again, it's it's really nice uh, actually when you have the workbook open because I'm also we also have the working solution open. So we're trying to fix code every year and then we update it directly in the same uh, text environment. And finally, this, this is great for instructors that then do have all the added bells and whistles. We have kind of like active learning assignments, activities, where we then just copy the, uh, the styled HTML back into our learning management system. And so if it's Canvas or Moodle, there's almost always a raw HTML editor. And you can just copy and paste it right back in. And so it's a, a really quick, like literally one button conversion to then download our whole book and get it into your local environment so it works with your assignments and deadlines. 
Okay, so that's uh, about it. I, I do I think I have a minute or so. So um, for those of you that might be interested in um, utilizing this book, of course, if, uh, if you're an independent learner, uh, it's all free, it's all available. And again, we'd love your feedback, log issues. Uh, we kind of, we, we don't respond to issues every month, but we have kind of a, a semester-based cycle where we do address all of the logged issues. Um, and if you are teaching, uh, I teach on a 15-week semester model. And so we have these three units, 11 weeks plus a final project. Uh, if you're on a 10-week uh, semester model, you could teach just the first two units, so end with leaflet, and then teach the final project. Um, or you could uh, uh, teach the whole thing with no final project, right? And then some folks I know teach kind of a full stack. Uh, we are not doing anything uh, with back end. We have a different course for that in our uh, UW curriculum. But if you are teaching full stack, you could grab just our leaflet lab and combine that with like a, a Postgres lab or, or some other uh, a spatial databases lab uh, so that you're actually integrating the, the front end and the back end. Okay, with that, I think uh, I'll take questions. One question in the chat. Um, the question was how many weeks is in the term, how many hours are spent in the lab each week uh, with your last slide, but. Yeah, yeah, so uh, it's 15 weeks, and then again, we try to open this for four weeks. One awesome additional uh, advantage of GitHub is that it's purposely collaborative. And so students form final project groups, which in the past was kind of artificial. Um, you had to be in person. The pandemic showed us that having GitHub as the basis of the course really facilitates group collaboration. And so we add, we add a month for that final project. And this the first the proposal of the, the student project is the first readme page of the GitHub repo that eventually will turn into the final project. Um, we have 15 weeks for us, but we've modularized it in a way that we hope can fit different kinds of curriculum. Uh, another question from the chat was, have you found an efficient way to give students feedback in GitHub submission? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so uh, uh, GitHub has this tool called GitHub Education, which we explored it about a year and a half ago, and it was just really disappointing in its ability to um, provide feedback. Um, one issue is th there's a FERPA policy where we can't allow grading to be um, open. And so what we've, what we've done is students will uh, commit their repos, and then we look at them on a local server, and then provide feedback still in the traditional, uh, uh, traditional manner. I think with issues, there could be an interesting assignment where there's peer-to-peer -peer critique, which can be um, uh, something that is open and available that then we look at and say, um, you know, this is certain numbers of points uh, uh, based on that discussion. Um, there's also milestones that we use to grade the final project. So students set their own milestones, like here's how you should grade me. And then we just like say yes or no. Um, but yeah, the actual like written feedback, there's really not a great way in GitHub, um, even with private repos, the way that organizations are set up. Somewhat problematic, and GitHub Education not quite there for our needs, at least. Um, uh, any questions in the room? We have one more question online. Uh, are there plans to make the core, the back end course, open and available too? Uh, so I, I'm wearing many hats right now. I, I currently also am the director of our GIS uh, um, programs, which we're also hiring a tenure track director. Uh, so we're having two hires uh, in, in GI science. Someone take this job for me, please. Uh, but the, I, I think one of the goals to improve the maintenance strategy is to um, have some of our, our foundational courses. So in this case, 575 being really the client-based course, um, our 574 classes, the spatial databases course, be open as kind of almost a freemium model. Um, and then uh, we add kind of our activities and, and uh, learning assignments on top of it. Um, so I hope that we, I'd hope to see, that, and this incentivizes the, the faculty member as well, um, having kind of this open textbook. So I'd like to see more of that coming from our professional programs, recognizing that we can't give away everything for free. Um, I would say Penn State has a great model where they have given away a lot of open source material, I think to the benefit of their programs. So I think it helps everyone um, to, be, to be sharing as much as possible. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, thank you everyone. Good to see you.